Great. Welcome to the IMAP Invasives 3.0 uh, first webinar series for training folks on how to use the, the new New York State Invasive Species Database. Um, just some quick introductions. I'm Jennifer Dean, and we have... John Marino in the room as well. <laughs> we're both from the New York Natural Heritage Program, and um, we're going to be working with you today. And as we go along, John is going to be um, monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions at all, um, you can type into the chat box that is on the, the WebEx interface. Um, any questions, so if you have que problems logging in or things like that, um, you can chat him. We might not, you know, if there's a whole bunch all at once, we, you know, we might not be able to get to them until the very end of the webinar, but we will definitely um, help you troubleshoot any problems that you have. Um, but, you know, if there's just a couple, then he'll try to troubleshoot as we go along. Um, so you can, you can um, text directly, or I'm sorry, chat directly to John through the WebEx interface, or you can, um, there's also an option to chat to everyone on there. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and once again, thanks for attending. And from the registration, I can see that there's a, a big mix of folks, um, some people who have been using IMAP Invasives for years, and um, some who are brand new to the community. So welcome to everyone, and thanks for attending. And just a little bit of background, uh, IMAP Invasives launched in New York in 2010 as the state's invasive species database. We needed a way that all agencies and organizations and so forth could communicate invasive species findings and, you know, aggregate information from the public, so our citizen scientists as well. Uh, this database is managed by the New York Natural Heritage Program with funding through the New York State Environmental Protection Fund. And there is a wider network of states and provinces using IMAP invasives. So, um, the training that we're doing is focusing on New York, but know if you're traveling around other states, you can also enter data um, throughout the, the continent, really. All right. And so here in New York, we use IMAP invasives in a number of ways. Of course, reporting tools are really key. We want people to be able to quickly and easily um, enter information as they find it. So if you stumble across a new invasive species or just a new infestation of something you've seen in other places, you can either use one of the tools that we're going to talk about, so the mobile app or the web browser, to, to enter that information. Uh, we also use the database for tracking control efforts and the results of those control efforts. We are not going to get into that in this webinar, but we're going to, that will be the, the next in the series, so the more advanced data will cover treatments and surveys and so forth, uh, but just so that you know that that exists, that functionality exists. And, you know, by getting this data aggregated in, a, in standardized formats and so forth, this gives us a much better idea of the species distributions um, across the state. So we're getting this, you know, of course, there will always be data gaps um, where things have not been detected yet, but we're getting a much better picture of those overall just distributions. And of course, communicating important findings is um, very key. So we, we're um, developing an early detection um, email alert system that is similar to what we had in IMAP2. That's something that's going to occur in the next rollout. Um, but this is you know, key to helping us communicate to agency staff and identify um, important findings so that folks can be strategic in their, their um, invasive species efforts. So we've been, you know, using IMAP invasives for those key functions across the state for 10 years now. And over the course of 10 years, technology, of course, has changed quite a bit. And so this online mapping website that we developed in, um, before 2010 had, you know, had grown out of date. And so over the last year and a half, we've been working with NatureServe, which is an international organization focused on conservation data. And um, they developed a, a new interface leveraging um, current mapping technologies into IMAP Invasives 3.0. And this launched in April. And there's a lot of more or a lot of additional features coming. Uh, so what we launched, we wanted to make sure we got something out in time for the field season. It has the all the data entry components, and it also has very 
um, basic map filtering and map navigating, but there will be more coming. So I know a lot of people are missing those email alerts and the really detailed queries that we had in IMAP2, but um, you know, just hold tight. We will get those out as soon as we can in the next couple of months, and um, we hope that you'll love those even more as well. All right. And, you know, I just want to make sure that everyone understands the different interfaces that you have to choose from within IMAP Invasives. Um, so, you know, this is an, an online platform. There's a, we're using, using the Amazon um, cloud services to host this information. Um, if you look at the right, like the whole database is on the web. So whether you're on your mobile device using a web browser or you're on your laptop or desktop, using your web browser with connectivity, you can access the whole database. Um, and this is a big change from IMAP2 where um, the mobile, like if you opened up your web browser on your smartphone with IMAP2, you could, you could access the database, but it was really clunky because it was not a mobile responsive um, website, and now it is. So if you open up, you know, if you have connectivity, you go to the website and you um, open up IMAP Invasives, you can navigate the, the entire system pretty easily. So it's, it's, this is a huge step forward as well because I know, you know folks are using their phones probably even more so than their computers these days. Um, but keeping that in mind, there's also on the left-hand side there the mobile application. And John will be talking about this in more detail later, but the, this mobile application is still super valuable because this is the ability to collect your simple data very quickly when you're out in the field, and especially when you don't have connectivity. Um, or even if you do have connectivity, but you just want to you know, collect that presence or not detected data in a, a quick and efficient way um, so that you can upload it later. And this is a standalone um, software, essentially, that you're downloading onto your phone, so just like any mobile application that you might download onto your phone, and it interacts as well with the, um, the servers that are you know, running IMAP invasive. So when you do upload those, they go straight into the interface. All right, and we know, you know, change is hard for sure. And sometimes technology can be really tricky to learn when you're first getting into it, into a new thing. So there is always a learning curve and we are trying to get as many help documents as, out there as quickly as we can. Um, one of the advantages to having lots of other states and provinces Working with IMAP Invasives is we have this whole network of other um, jurisdictions who are also creating help documents, and so we're we're kind of leveraging. Um, you know, we'll make something. Oregon might make something, so forth, and we're we're putting these into um, um, one shared area of help documents. So you can see that um, the IMAP network help documents are at um, imapinvasives.org/backslash/help, and there's a lot of very valuable things there. Um, for New York specifically, we also have a lot of New York IMAP resources at nyimapinvasives.org. And so that's going to have, um, you know, training sessions and links to those help documents, um, you know, some species of interest here for New York specifically, um, links to all the PRISM partners. If you're not familiar with the PRISMs, um, those are a great resource across the state to tap into as well for each region. Um, so lots of good resources there. And then, of course, there are real people behind this database that want to help you, you know, if you get stuck on anything, you can always email us, um, imapinvasives at dec.ny.gov. And somebody will, will get to you pretty quickly and, um, you know, try to help you out. All right, and like I said, during this webinar, you can use the chat box to um, chat with John Marino and he'll help you get through some of these um, tricky spots if you get stuck. Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and flip over to the, oops, not that, to the, the website. And so this is our homepage, the nyimapinvasives.org. We have um, lots of great resources on there. Um, we also have the login button. So that's probably where, you know, most people will be going. And we're going to, before you do anything on this page, um, <laughs> Just um, I'll walk through some of the little nuances. So, you know, in the process of building this huge database, um, we had to migrate all the data, right? So we had millions of data points from across the nation. We had um, 
tens of thousands of users um, that have been using the system across the nation that we also had to migrate essentially that data into the new database. So that means that if you previously had an IMAP and Visas account, we don't want you to create a new account. We want you to keep your previous account because any data that you may have entered before, um, we want that tied to the new you as well, <laughs> you know, going forward, or I guess the same you. Um, so if, if you did have a previous account, what you would need to do is type in the email address that you used for IMAP Invasives 2. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, actually, I'm, if you've already signed in once before, you can just sign in that way. But if you, haven't, if you have never signed in yet to IMAP Invasives 3 and, um, you know, you know what your email account was, you use that forgot password um, link. And so it's going to ask you to, that's where you type in your email address from your old account. If you cannot remember which email address you might have used, because some people got accounts like 10 years ago and might have had a different job, you could chat John Marino now and he can look it up on his administrative database. Because I saw some people had different, some people on the registration for today um, were using different emails to sign up for this webinar than they had associated with their IMAP2 account. You know, some people had Gmail accounts or from previous jobs and things like that. So you do want to reset your password um, to log in for the first time ever into IMAP3. And one thing that um, folks are getting hung up on, sometimes the activation email that gets sent is going to um, go to your spam folder. Um, those emails seem to be getting lost every once in a while. So what it's going to do, you're going to reset your password. It's going to send you an activation email. Um, and then you're going to, um, oops, you're going to have to click on the link and activate it. And so um, here, I'm going to go back to that login page. Um, if you don't see that email and you've looked in your spam folder and you just can't find it, then you could go ahead and chat John as well. and um, he'll try to, try to force it on the back end. Now, if you're completely brand new to IMAP Invasive, you've never had an account before, then feel free to go ahead and sign up. So first name, last name, you'll want to pick New York as your jurisdiction. Um, you'll hit join. And once again, it's going to send you an activation email, just like you know every other website that you sign up for these days. Um, and if you can't find that activation email to click on the link, or if you have any other problems with that activation link, then let us know. You know, either chat John or um, or um, send us. You know, if it's afterwards, then you can send us an email. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and log in with my account. All right, and here I am logged in. There's um, information. I think the first time that you log in, you're going to see the terms of use. So, you know, please read through that. That just tells us how we use your data. Um, now with IMAP3, you're, you know, you're agreeing to let us share your data with other invasive species efforts. So there's other invasive species databases across the country um, and things like that that, um, you know, we want to make sure that this information is, is getting shared. Um, so read through those terms of service or terms of use for sure. And here we are in the, the IMAP invasives platform. And so you can, um, it starts out in this network-wide view, and you can see which states have been working hard over the last 10 years to accumulate a lot of data within the IMAP Invasive system. And now that we have this more network-wide or continental-wide um, view of it, we, you know, we hope to um, be able to link up with other databases as well and, and um, share that information and get more information in here. And so you can, um, if you're on your desktop or uh, even on your web browser on your mobile device, you can pan and zoom on the map, just kind of like you would do, say, with Google Maps or something like that. Um, you know, so there's a lot of easy navigation. If you click on the, the map anywhere, it's thinking that you're trying to identify something underneath your click, and you'll see that it'll spin for a moment, and then it'll pop up a little um, box um, with the results. So if you click on one of these hexagons, which is showing all species there, then it's going to, um, um, to identify what species are there. But here, because I just kind of clicked in the middle of Canada, um, there wasn't anything under my click. 
it can be, you know, it takes a little bit of learning to, to not just um, randomly click on the map or that box will keep popping up. So you just need to close that box to, um, to continue on. And then on the left-hand side, we have some navigation tools. So you can zoom in and out with um, those navigation tools. You can, um, the little house here is the default map view. So that takes you back out to the continental view. Um, the one with the crosshairs is find my location. And so this will, um, you know, you'll get a pop-up. If you wanted to find your location, you need to allow location access. And if you're on your smartphone, you know, sometimes you have to dig in your browser settings to figure out where that is. Um, on your desktop, it usually pops up. Um, so I did allow my, um, allow to find my location. Since I'm inside on an Ethernet connection, it's not necessarily going to go to exactly where I am. But if you're on your your mobile phone, then it'll um, it should go to where your GPS is. And then, of course, you can search for places. So if I wanted to search for um, 625 Broadway, which is where the DC office is, I can do that, and it'll go right to that spot. All right, and then so those are all the tools along the uh, the left hand side, and then we have tools along the top right as well. Um, just a quick tip, if you were on IMAP earlier in the day and you come back and this window still looks like this, but instead you see login right there, that means your session has timed out and you need to log back in. Um, you won't see create record unless you've been logged in. But um, create record is where you enter all your data. I'm going to go through that last because we'll spend a little more time on that. Um, but there are some other useful tools. you can. If you have a record ID number, say somebody has sent you and you want to look up that specific record, you can type it in here for the different record types. Um, you can filter records, say by um, species name. So if I wanted to do garlic mustard, we can um, see what garlic mustard we have. Oh, <laughs> we must have a test point right in the middle of the DEC building. Um, so garlic mustard is in various spots. I wanted to say, um, you know, get a bigger um, statewide view of something. Let's turn on mile a minute and then zoom out a little bit. And then we'll be able to see how those, so at this scale, you can see there's um, where my cursor is, there's a couple points of mile a minute. But as I zoom out, those points at some point become those hexagons once again. And so now we're getting that distribution data with the hexagons, and as I zoom out a little bit more, you can see where the, um, those different hexagons are showing the distribution of mile a minute, because I have, you can see that little icon is green with the filtered records, so that means I have a filter on. Um, I can look at the layers, I can make those hexagons a little bit darker by uh, changing the transparency, and so now you can see the the distribution that we have across the state per mile a minute. And um, of course, if I zoom back in, then I'll get back down to that point level data. Um, so it changes at, you know, kind of roughly the, the size of a, a county. Um, it changes from those hexagons to those points. And that's a way to really increase the draw speed. One of the things that um, with IMAP2 is that it, it could really bog down. And because we were displaying that point data, um, at the state level, that was, you know, that's a lot of geographic information being um, sent um, at one time. So the hexagons um, really help with the draw speed. All right, and so, you know, I can zoom in a little bit more, and um, one of the, another cool tool up here is this identify measure tool. And so this, you can draw a box around um, the points you want to identify. So I clicked area, um, so that is, this is how I open up the identify tool. I draw a box around those points, I double click to end it, and then it, of course it gives me this, the area, but I really want to see what's here. So I'm going to click on that, and that should give me a list of um, what species that I, I, I mean, I'm sorry, which observations or presence records I have at that spot. So you can see all the different um, actual observations. You can click on details to open up that detailed record um, and get more information that you, if you need it. 
All right. And one thing to keep in mind, like I mentioned before, like if this table's open, all these tools across the top are disabled. So you need to make sure you close that table down if you want to, um, to get back to these tools. And another um, great thing about IMAP3 is now you can export shareable information. So um, in the past, you always had to contact us for a data request, and we had to um, process those on a case-by-case -case basis. But now if the information is marked as shareable, so essentially that's usually um, confirmed records that are not marked as confidential, um, then you can click that export tool and then it will give you whatever records are in the map extent that are shareable and in different formats as well. So we hope that will be really handy for folks. And then this last one, you can, if you want to get more real estate on your map, you can close that table of contents or you can open it back up and use these different features like change to satellite imagery on these base maps or um, you, know, you can turn different layers off and on. We're gonna go into, um, we'll learn a little bit about not detected records here in a bit, um, but mostly so these present species and the unconfirmed present species are what we would call our observations in IMAP2. You went to a location at a certain point in time and you saw it here, so you marked it. Um, and so those are all um, useful things to know about. And then um, down at the bottom it says show legend, and so that'll show you what the different color points mean. All right, so the next thing I wanna walk you through is creating a record. And so, um, let's see here, I'm gonna go ahead and there's this button here called Create Record. And for this webinar, we're just gonna focus on the, the basics of this. So we're gonna focus on two record types, um, a presence record, which as I said, we always called observations in IMAP2 lingo, um, and also not detected records. And so those are your, what people would call absence points, or you know, you essentially you went looking for a particular species, like hemlock woolly is eligible maybe, and you did not find it, and you wanna indicate that search effort. So I'm gonna start with the presence records. So if I click on that button, I get an option to um, place down either a point, a line, or a polygon. And actually I'm gonna, just for the sake of entering my, my test record here. I'm gonna go back over to the DEC building. Um, so I remember to delete this <laughs> when I get back. Um, and you can follow along and use the fake species um, data entry if you'd like. But so um, I'm gonna go ahead and place a point down on the Hudson River here close to our building. And you have a choice to add a buffer around that point if you want to. Um, it defaults to <laughs> no buffer around it, or you know, I could have done a polygon or a line as well. But I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to um, I'm going to keep that point. Oh, sorry, I got stuck for a sec. Keep that point right there. I'm going to hit next. It zooms in a little bit to your point, and then this is where I pick my species. And another new thing is that you can pick multiple species in one presence record. And so that will create individual observations essentially for multiple species. Because unfortunately, as we all know, you, it's not hard to stand in one spot and you know, from that one spot point out five different species, invasive species without actually moving. Um, so this is a quick way to, to get a lot of things in. So let's say I have, um, Black Swallowwort, you can start typing in the species name there. And then if I want additional uh, species, like let's say I saw a brown marmorated stink bug as well. So I saw two different species from this one point. It defaults to me as the observer, but you can change that if you want. It defaults to today's date. And really that is the bare bones information that is required to be entered. I could complete it at this step, but we would love to encourage everyone, of course, to enter photos, and so since those are very important. Um, so all the other, all the next things I'm going to show you, these additional fields are optional, um, but encouraged. Uh, you can select a project. If you have projects tagged to your account, you'll see them in this drop-down list. And um, of course, I have a test project <laughs> tagged to my account. You might have real projects tagged to your account. Oh. 
And before I go much further, um, I did say people could, um, you know, play along. If you're on your computer and you want to test this for real, please use the fake species for testing. So if you type in the word fake under the, the present species list, um, just do that one. Don't do as I do and, you know, I'm putting some real species in there for demo purposes. If you want to test this, just put in the fake species, please. Um, makes it easier at the end to, to get rid of all these. All right, and so for each of those species that I put in that box, it's going to give me additional options for data fields. Of course, photos. Photos are key. Um, online, you can still enter up to, um, up to five photos. And so I can add more photos. See, I put black swallowwort photo in there. I can add more if I want to. Um, but we also have some additional fields here. So let's say I have found four plants. I could either enter a percent cover for um, abundance or a, a more qualitative uh, distribution. So let's say I saw sparse scattered plants um, along there. And I am going to put in there, this is a test. <laughs> so I remembered that I will delete this. And actually, I'll show you how to delete your own records as well. Um, so those are some of the, the basic fields. You also have more fields that are available to you. Um, so I clicked on more fields for black swallowwort, and then I can add things like evaluation type, follow-up impact of the invasive at that site. Um, if you did submit something to an herbarium or museum, you can put in repository information. And then we also added fields for biocontrol. So for some of those, um, I know like the hypena um, moth is going to be released for black swallowwort at some point. And so if you're going out specifically monitoring for that, you can add your biocontrol agent if you found it. And also another new field is whether or not it's an intentional planting. And that's also very important information, you know, especially if it's a very new plant that we don't know how invasive it will become. So as I scroll on down, I'm going to get, you know, I see where I can add these types of details to the other species, so the, the brown marmorated stink bug and the face, fake species for testing. Um, one thing you'll note with the brown marmot stink bug, it has um, different fields than it had for, um, than it did for the plants. Um, it still has some of the, the same ones, but it also has things like, um, you know, evidence of the invasive. Sometimes like with emerald ash borer, you only see the emergence holes. You don't actually see the actual organism, or you might see the galleries under the bark. Um, so that kind of stuff is important. Um, a count, uh, number of plants affected, things like that, um, that are more specific to an insect or a forest pest. And then for our fake species, I consider that a terrestrial plant on the back end. So you'll see the same types of fields that were um, asked of the um, black swallowwort. And like I said, all of these fields are optional. We do highly, highly encourage you to, to add um, a photo. Um, at the very minimum, but you know, it's great to have this abundance and distribution information right in front of you as you're entering it because um, studies have shown that that abundance information is so critical in determining um, overall intensities and um, invasiveness of those species. So once I get this to a point where I want to um, submit it, it gives me a little summary. I can look over my information that I just submitted and then I can hit complete. And what this is going to do is it's going to turn on those layers um, on the back end that um, are showing the, where different points have been um, already submitted. And I'm going to have these different links. So there's something called a searched area record that is the backbone of all the records that are entered. Um, if you're only going in there to enter presence records, you won't necessarily ever really need to focus on that searched area. It's just automatically created for you. But once you get into the advanced data that I'll talk about um, later this week at the next webinar, um, that searched area becomes really valuable because it can tie together treatments and surveys and presences all together. But what we're really interested in here is our presence record. So we just submitted this one presence record for three different species. And so you get some um, basic information here. You can go to that searched area page if you want to, and there's actually lots more um, data fields that you can fill in if you want to. Um, we're going to focus on um, what we have here um, for our presence records. So, you know, we entered that black swallowwort. I've entered that photo. Here's a reference photo. You know, keep in mind that any of those photos um, under 
the word reference photo are being pulled from a database. So that's not the, the user entered um, photo, but it's very helpful to have next to it. Um, at the, the top bar of any of these records, there is an edit tool that you have available to you and a delete tool, which I'll use here at the end so that I can show you how to delete your own records. But any of your own records, just like in IMAP2, you can edit yourself um, until it is confirmed. And then if you need to edit it further, further after it's confirmed, please let us know. Um, I can make any of my records that I've entered confidential. There's a checkbox there. Um, just keep in mind that if you make something confidential, it becomes hidden from the map, and that means including hidden from you. Um, if it's valuable information and you know you want um, the state authorities to know about this species at this location, but you're concerned, say, about private property rights um, or concerns, then you can mark that as confidential, and it will disappear from the map except for a few key people at the state level. Um, and I can edit any of these fields that I want to at this time. So this edit mode is a good way to see like what fields are available altogether. These are the same fields that were, appeared to us um, when we were entering the record. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and save this, even though I didn't necessarily make any changes there, but I'm going to show you, we're very excited, now we have a delete button for everyone to use. Um, in the past, you always had to email us to, to delete your own records, and you can delete it until it's confirmed, of course. Um, and then I, you can put a reason removed, and this is a test record, and I'm gonna say yes. And now my record has been deleted, which is great. Um, all right. All right, so one other thing I wanted to show you with the Create Record tool is how to create a not detected record. And this is another thing we're very excited about in IMAP3 is that now you can enter a not detected record for any species in the database. So since this is basically an area that you're searching, it does default to polygon. So say I search this whole grove of trees um, for something. I can um, draw my polygon around there. I can go to the next step, and it's gonna ask me what species that I looked for but I did not find. And so maybe that was a grove of um, hemlock trees and I was looking for hemlock woolly adelgid. So it's gonna ask me how long I searched for it because that area that you searched plus the time that you put into it is a good um, measure of the intensity of the search, right? So maybe I just spent 10 minutes searching those trees. It has me as the observer, the date, you know, I can put down um, any projects I want to. I can add photos showing that it wasn't there. Um, this is a new field, the reason for not detecting. Um, oops, sorry. Here, and we have eliminate, presumed eliminated due to treatment, habitat no longer exists, low detectability, like maybe it's wrong timing, the season, low abundance, so forth, or maybe we've just never found it here and this is the first time um, I'm looking. And so I'm gonna hit next. It gives me a little summary and then hit complete. And that will save my not detected record. Um, and that's also, you know, popping up as one of the options on the map. So I can, once again, I can click on that link to view my not detected record, and it goes right over to, um, you know, similar to what we saw as that, that presence record, but it has not detected blaring all over it to hopefully make it, you know, very obvious that this was not detected. Um, here's your reference photo showing what it would look like, you know, and hopefully I just, like for hemlock woolly adelgid, I usually take a photo of the hemlock tree that I'm, I'm searching just so that the confirmer knows that I know what a hemlock, you know, that I was searching the right tree species, that kind of thing. Um, but once again, I'm going to delete this record. All right, and you can test that using those fake species as well. Um, so it gives you a lot of options there. All right, so we have gone through those tools across the top and um, the navigation tools. One other tool that I haven't shown you yet, it's a little hidden where the, the leaf icon is, there's a menu bar there. So I'm gonna click that men menu bar and I'll see different options available to me. You can see that you're logged in. Um, you can actually look at the species list. Um, jurisdiction means New York for you. Um, so you can see what species we have tracked in New York State. 
Um, I'll go into those lists in more detail on the um, next webinar series in the series. Um, network species list as for, you know, anybody tracking any invasive. So there's like 4,000 species on that network species list versus maybe 400 on the jurisdiction. Um, projects, organizations, which I'll go into on the Thursday webinar, or I'm sorry, no, the last webinar when we do the power users webinar. Um, but what I want to show you here is your account. So if you're in the system, go ahead and click on your account. And this is where we want to make sure that we have all the the information or that you have all the information that you need in there. Um, so once again, there's this little edit tool up there. You can um, you know, make sure your home jurisdiction is set to New York if that's where you're doing most of your work. Um, the primary organization is something that we want to pay attention to. If you are collecting invasive species data for your job um, and you want that information by default tagged to your organization, then you do need to have a primary organization there. And I'm going to show you how to do that here in a moment. There's a couple of different steps to it. But, you know, as you're scrolling through, make sure all your information is correct. Um, you know, we did take out the address fields, but it's very helpful to have zip code in there, you know, if we're doing analyses later down the road. Um, but as I scroll down, you'll see these boxes that say um, projects, organization, and jurisdictional privileges. Um, we're not getting into the jurisdictional privileges on this webinar. That'll be in the last one. But, you sh but here we'll talk about the projects and the organizations. Um, if you were a part of any IMAP2 projects, then those carried over, hopefully. Um, so you should see yourself as a member of those projects. And you can, since you're able to edit things, you can remove yourself if you'd like to. You can also request to join a project. And if you do this, so say, I'm sure there's some other, <laughs> there's some other testing project in there. If I hit request to join that project, then the um, administrator for that project will get an email saying that I have requested to join and then that person has to log in and then accept my request. So it's the same thing with organizations. And I feel like, you know, if you're doing this for your job, this is very key. So if you're working for say New York State Parks, um, Let's see, there's probably a better, you know what? <laughs> I will do park recreation, I'll do the, the acronym, Office of Parks, Recreation, Historic Preservation. Um, so if I'm, you know, say summer staff, I need to join my, that organization, I will request to join. And then people from state parks that are admins of this organization will receive an email. They will add you to their organization and then at that point, you'll have to log back in, and now um, that organization will be found as a default or an option under your primary organization. So there are a couple steps there. You need to request a join, your admin needs to accept you, and then you have to get back in and, and put your default organization in there. All right. So once, oh, and I should say, once you do all that, you should save your um, I'm not going to save this now because I don't, I don't want to uh, request to join those, but you would need to save. I'm going to go ahead and hit cancel so it does not save those changes. All right, so at that point, I'm going to go back to the map, and I'm going to turn this back over to John now. So we talked about, you know, the whole database that you have available to you on your web browser, so whether that's on your phone or your mobile phone, um, but now John's going to talk about the mobile app itself and some of the changes that have been made with the mobile app. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Jen. Um, so you can see that on the screen now? Yep. Okay, perfect. So um, for those of you who have used the IMAP mobile app in the past, um, you probably won't notice anything too dramatically different. Uh, we've made a lot of changes in order to um, get the data to upload properly into IMAP3, um, but overall uh, the app has a very similar look and feel uh, to how it was previous to IMAP3. And also, um, please bear with us too in case you detect any bugs. We are actively working on a few um, issues that uh, some people have encountered. Um, but overall, everything is, is functioning to be able to upload data, but if you uh, encounter any bugs with the app, um, 
please just be patient, and we are hoping to actually release even an updated version very soon, hopefully by the end of the month, to fix some, some of the bugs you may encounter. Okay, so um, basically uh, the first step would be to download the app if you do not already have it, and the easiest way we, we generally recommend to do that is by going to either the App Store on um, any iOS devices, such as an iPhone or the Google Play Store, and just searching for IMAP Invasive. And the first result should be IMAP Invasive Mobile, and um, then simply download that app. And uh, when you run it for the first time, or if you've updated it recently to get to version 3.0.0, .0 .0, um, you will immediately, the first time you open the app, you will be presented with the preferences page, as you should see on the screen. And uh, the reason for this is because um, now with IMAP3, um, we want you to reinitialize the preferences uh, in the app in order to uh, log in correctly to your account. Now that IMAP3 utilizes uh, email, an email address for your username. So um, pretty much every time, or the first time you open the app, whether it's the first time you've downloaded or just recently updated to IMAP3, you should see this screen. So at this point, um, I would recommend selecting New York as your jurisdiction, assuming that is where you are uh, actively working. And then uh, simply a matter of entering the email address that is associated with your IMAP Invasive 3 account. And also I should note um, that I recommend um, at this point, um, hopefully you've already signed into your account using the steps that Jen mentioned previously. Um, and so because this is the same username and password as is in the online interface. So once you've entered your email address and password, um, what I generally suggest doing is to select this Retrieve IMAP Lists button. And at this point, and whoops, I probably entered the incorrect password. Bear with me one moment. Okay, there we are. So um, once you select the Retrieve IMAP List button using the uh, correct username and password that you have associated with IMAP3, you should receive this message that says uh, your IMAP invasive data was retrieved successfully. And what this will do is populate the species list, project list, and organization lists. Uh, so if your user account is associated with a project and or an organization, you will have the ability to tag records uh, to the project or organization directly from the app. So this is a little bit of a change as well from IMAP2 because uh, previously um, there was sort of an unfiltered list of all of the projects, uh, whereas now um, it's more uh, directed towards your own account. So you'll only see uh, the projects that are relevant to your account. So then, uh, once you do that, you can also initialize any of the other, you can set the, you know, any of the other uh, preferences for the app. Um, you can select to display species names in either, as either scientific or common, or both. You can actually select both uh, options. You can also um, select a custom species list, and what that will do is reduce the uh, length of the species list when you uh, select it from the dropdown. So let's say that I only am interested in fake species. I can select that from this list. And you'll see in a moment that now I'll only see uh, the fake species in uh, my list for the species dropdown. Um, you can also select your uh, default photo quality on upload um, in case you're interested, in case you are concerned about uh, data uh, or bandwidth, if you're using a cellular connection, you can reduce the photo size slightly. 
um, we recommend uh, leaving at 50 or 100 percent. And you can also have the app save any photos you take directly into your photo library in case you want to uh, have the full resolution photos later uh, uh, to review on the device after the, the records are uploaded. So I recommend using that feature as well. You can uh, have the map, which was in the app, uh, set to either a road map or a, an aerial image by default. So I'll select satellite as well as the default zoom level to where, to what uh, zoom level the map is by default, as well as measurement system. And again, here, the final two options, uh, your default project and organization. Um, these allow you to have these projects and organizations already loaded every time you create a new record in the app uh, so that you don't have to select it every single time. So I'll go ahead and add those in as well. And you can enable or disable the overlay, which provides some helpful instructions um, every each time you load the app. So we go ahead and save uh, my preferences. And at this point, now you will be directed into uh, the main map interface screen. If it, or I'm sorry, the main IMAP interface on the mobile app. If at any point you want to return to the preferences page, you can do so by selecting the menu and selecting preferences, at which point you'll be returned to the preferences page if you ever want to make any changes. And so I'm going to go ahead now and uh, create an observation in the app. So if this is the first time loading the app or um, using it, uh, you'll probably be prompted to on Android and iOS to allow the app to uh, know your current location. And um, so I strongly encourage uh, selecting allow, and that will place the record um, at your current location from the device GPS. So the very first um, option in the, in the observation is the photo. Um, you have two options. You can either um, select the first button to uh, use the camera to take a photo for the record. Alternatively, if you have already taken a photo uh, that is currently in your photo library, you can select the second option um, and that will open um, your, your device's photo library so you can select um, an image to use for your observation. And for the purposes of this, um, the way I'm sharing this, unfortunately, I can't really show the camera functionality because it's not work in this simulated environment. Um, but once you once you uh, select your photo, um, then you're immediately prompted for which species you would like. And so, since I had just selected um, fake species for my custom species list, and that's the only option in the custom list, that's the only option I see. So I will select that. You can also toggle your the custom species list or the full list uh, using this checkbox. Um, again, apologies if you notice any difficulties with this uh, functionality, but um, just know that we do have an update coming soon. Um, and so this is another. So this is one place that is different in the observation uh, creation for the app. So you're now prompted to either select the species was detected or not detected. Um, so this now enables you to create a not detected record for any species in the entire species list as opposed to an IMAP2 where it was limited to just a few species. So hopefully this will be very helpful for uh, use in the field. And uh, again, defaults to today's date. Um, and so next, um, you'll see the map area. Uh, you have a few options. One, you can toggle the GPS on and off. Um, and the only time you would toggle the GPS off would be if you would want to manually uh, place your record at a particular point. Let's say you already have uh, known coordinates. Uh, you can enter them here in longitude, latitude format, and the record will be created at those coordinates. But otherwise, um, most um, most of the time, you'll probably just leave the GPS selection on, and the record will always be at your current location. Another quick tip, actually, um, if you 
do want to move the point manually on the map, if you zoom in and then just tap on the yellow pin once, it, which at which point it will turn pink and actually have GPS on. So again, I'd recommend turning GPS off if you're going to manually move the point. Um, so it's, it's a matter of uh, tapping the yellow point on the map and then uh, just dragging the pink point to your correct location and then simply tapping on the map anywhere and now my record has been moved um, to the new location. So additionally, we have a few extra data fields. Um, again, you'll, you'll note that uh, not all data fields are present in um, the mobile app. Um, in the future, we may work to add uh, more fields um, for data entry, but as of now, uh, you're presented with uh, just some basic um, assessment type questions which will be associated with the record. So again, the IMAP3 project and organization, that those have, uh, were added by default since I selected them in the preferences page. I can also add my time searched uh, in minutes, just as Jen showed in the online record creator. And I can also select an area. Um, unfortunately, uh, from the mobile app, you don't quite have the ability to add, for instance, a polygon yet, but this is a good way to give a sense of the size of the infestation. And you can also select um, distribution since the fake species is uh, considered a plant, as well as we can enter any observation comments. So I'm going, and then you simply uh, select save, uh, and now your record appears here and it's ready for upload. So I'm also, just for the sake of example, I'm also just going to create another record for not detected so we can see how that works as well. So I'm just going to leave everything else blank. Great. So now we have two records, and uh, because they're uh, in this yellow uh, background, that means they are ready for upload. And so we can see um, we now have one detected, one not detected for fake species. And so now if you're ready to upload, simply um, you can use the menu tool to select all records. And then you can simply select upload selected. And because of this simulation I have it, let's see, let me just try to reopen the app. Sometimes in this, uh, when I'm running the app in this way, sometimes it's a few steps. Let's try this way. Perfect. So now um, those records have um, been successfully uploaded, so you no longer see them in the pending uh, card upload area, and so you're ready to collect more records. Um, so I'll just briefly uh, show on the map, uh, if you bear with me one moment. So I uploaded the records um, in the Syracuse area, right near Thorndon Park. So uh, all I'll need to do is simply refresh the map by moving it or zooming in. Um, and we can now see um, if I do identify measure tool. And again, remember to actually turn on the layers um, which you have uh, just created. So for instance, uh, I uh, created a presence record and a not detected record. So in the uh, layer selector, just make sure you have those uh, layers toggled on. And remember as well that each new presence record will go in as unconfirmed. So I just did a uh, area selection and we can see here is my uh, unconfirmed presence record which I just created. And we can see with, we can see the fields that we entered including the project all went in okay. And we can also see, here's my not detected record that I just created as well. 
So I believe that is all I have for a quick overview of the app. We do have a few other help documents available on imapinvasive.org and nyimapinvasive.org um, to help with help uh, getting started with the app if you're new or uh, with some tips for uh, updating the app if you have used it previously. Great, thank you, John. Um, are you able to unmute everyone? Yes. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and unmute. Um, if you do have a lot of background noise, then just you can manually mute unless you have a question, then you can unmute yourself. Oh, do or I maybe, need to do that? Let's see here. Maybe um, if you do have a question, you, you should have the capability to unmute. unmute. Okay, you can unmute yourself. Um, so we'll open it up to any questions. Um, I know that was a lot to cover, and of course, you know, there's um, you can always reach us as well later if you think of something else. Um, I did have one quick question for John that I thought of while he was doing that app demo. So if you do um, request to join an organization and you're you're waiting for your supervisor to you know accept your request when you're setting up the app. Do you have to come back to the app later to fill in your default organization, and would you have to like do that retrieve? That's a great update point. Update the list. Yes. So um, I, that is basically a matter of going back into the preferences page, and this large button that, um, if you used the app previously, it was actually down at the bottom, but uh, I've sort of repositioned it up to be near your username and password. Um, so yes, so let's say I had recently just been, I had, I had my account had just been added to a new organization. Uh, by default, um, that won't show up in the app unless you uh, complete the process of selecting the retrieve IMAP lists button, um, at which point you should see this message again. And at that point, your organization and project lists should uh, reflect your current Great. updated organization. All right, thank you. Um, let's see, do we have any other questions? Let's see, I do, actually I see one on the chat. Somebody's asking how to get an organization added to the site. Oh, great question. Um, so you can email us, um, here, where's my, I'm gonna go ahead and pop this. Oh, I need to share my screen. Um, hold on a sec. Uh, you at, um, oh, I can't share my screen. Oh, at, I'm sorry. Oh no, uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess John has to share it with me. Um, you can email us at the IMAP invasives at dec.ny.gov, and that will um, that will uh, you know just tell us what organization to add, and we'll get you added in there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pop that up real quick so you can see our email address. Um, oh, I didn't actually share my my screen, did I? Ah, here we go. Okay, sorry about that, there we go. Um, so yeah, shoot us an email, we'll get your organization added for you. Any other questions, either um, audio or through the chat box? All right, well, we Jennifer? would like to, oh yeah, we have a question there. Hi, it's Frank Williams, uh, I had text you a question about uh, and the instructions for editing an observation, it says to go to the summary page. But from what I'm understanding, that summary page access is not available right now? Oh, um, it is available. And that's actually what John was just showing. Oops, sorry, I'm zooming out instead of zooming in. So if you go to your point on the map, bear with me for a sec. Um, here we go. I can. Um, if you click on your point, like you saw how John was able to click on his point, like if right. you find your, so what I was saying on the, um, in the chat box is at this time we don't have a way to query for your own records that will oh. be coming, um, and that will make it much easier to find, <laughs> find your own point. But if you can at least zoom to the location of where you put your point, say that was my point, um, which is not, so I'm not actually going to have um, editing rights over it. but. You will, if you click on it, or you use that identify measure tool, like John did, and draw the shape around a cluster of points. Um, it will give you the results of what's there, and then you hit this details, 
And if this is your own record, which this one is not my own record, it will have that edit button up in the upper um, right-hand corner. Okay, but somewhere down the road will be like we had in the uh, IMF2 uh, system where you could actually find all of your own records and then uh, work with yes. them. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so right now you just have to navigate on the map to it, but you're right. Yep, we'll have a, you know, later this summer we'll have a, a query and, you know, a, a shortcut to be able to find just your records. Very good. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Another question uh, is concerning when you're creating a not detected record, and I should have mentioned that um, in the IMAP3 interface, so when you're using the mobile app, um, in the past, you have just created a point. And for IMAP3, that is still true for the presence record. You are creating a presence point at the GPS location when you save the record. Now, for not detected, um, the way it's basically working is that when you create a not detected record from the app, it will automatically apply a five meter radius uh, buffer around your GPS location. And so in the future, we're hoping to enhance that a little bit to be able to specify uh, more of an area. Um, but for the time being, it, it will be applying that five meter buffer from your location. And what you could do um, is then, you know, you could create those points, upload them, and let's say you want to do some fine tuning of the location. Um, then you could uh, simply find that record and edit it on the online interface to give it a, a more representative area of your search location. Uh, but at least it gives you the ability to have that not detected record. So I hope that helps to answer that. All right. Any other last, uh, last questions for now? And like I said, if you had any troubles at all logging in, I know that has been a little bit of a challenge, especially if your IMAP2 account was migrated to IMAP3. Um, there's been, um, you know, some complications with getting people logged back into the new system for the first time. Um, so please contact us. You have our email address. Um, reach out and we will um, answer it as quickly as we can and get you in there. All right, well, I want to thank everybody again. And I hope you have fun out there and, um, you know, use the app and get the information that you need. All right, thank you.